Hello and welcome back to the Cardboard Box Item. We are Michael, Sean and Steve. And today it's a very special episode because we're going to debate. We're going to debate a question that's been ravaging the minds of our greatest philosophers for years. Um, That question is, is The Evil Within a good survival horror game? Now, we have two combatants here. In the blue corner for that motion is Sean Moher. Hello. And in the beige corner from Japan (laughs) against this motion is Stephen Hill. Good day. (laughs) Good day, as they say in Japan. Um, So just a bit of background. uh, The Evil Way In was developed by Tango Gameworks. It's a survival horror game, which we are debating how accurate that is today, um, made by Shinji Mikami, who's, of course the grandfather of the survival horror genre, having worked on games like Resident Evil and Dino Crisis, stuff like that for Capcom. Um, We will be primarily focusing on just the base, no frills, the evil within as it came out day one, no DLC, no sequel. This is just about the evil within. Um, What game is that about? (laughs) Dino Crisis, listen. (laughs) Open your ears. Um, so I think I'm just going to throw across to Sean Moore for a friendly opening remark. Cool. Well, as Michael stated, I am for uh, the motion of The Evil Within being a good survival horror game. Um, personally, it's a game I have a lot of fond memories with. Um, really enjoyed playing it. Um, reasons for it being a good survival horror game? Well, I think... The fact that it was made by Shinji Mikami as well, who who directed Resident Evil 4, which is kind of the first game to coin the phrase survival horror. Um, is it, actually? Maybe that's... A, <laughs> let me my, go. my eyebrows raised at that statement, but man, yeah, keep going, it's your opening quite. statement. <laughs> no, actually, yeah, that's wrong. Well, I, I read that somewhere, but anyway. Um, <laughs> maybe survival <laughs> this horror. Is I just realised how this easy is this great. is going to be. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me restart, let me restart. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sean Moore. <laughs> okay. Um, so I am for The Evil Within being a good survival horror game. And uh, a few reasons why I think this is. It has a very enriching, uh, mystery-laden uh, story, which I think is uh, a key key part to any survival good survival horror game. Um, the combat is... While not extremely difficult, not extremely easy, it's got a good middle ground, but it can be very unforgiving at times as well, which again, I think is um, a kind of a staple of the genre. Um, It also includes uh, crafting mechanics and resource management, which again is another typical staple of the genre. And I guess like as as you play the game, there's a good sense of like dread and... um, just looking over your shoulder that kind of fear throughout the whole thing I wouldn't say it's like uh, too jump scary which can be a bit cheap anyway Uh, there are a few here and there but I think um, it's more the sense of dread as you go through the game and um, yeah it's just (laughs) yeah that's that's what what a compelling end (laughs) yeah very (laughs) classic Sean end really no but I think there's some very very salient points there which we will get into throughout the podcast but uh, I just want to throw it over to the against side Stephen Hill your opening remark please so I am arguing that the evil within is not a good survival horror game and I have a few reasons The first reason that I have is that it sends very mixed messages out in what it wants to do. So it's presenting itself as like a psychological horror with like, uh, you know, things happening that may or may not be there. Uh, But in actual fact, the entire game is really just about ammo management and clearing out rooms of zombies for pretty much the entire game. And all the big set pieces, which kind of masquerade as horror are really just action set pieces. Not very bad action set pieces, but they are action-y. I'd also say that, uh, Sean, you were saying that um, you're kind of looking over your shoulder a lot of the time, and it uh, you know brings a great sense of dread. I would argue that happens occasionally, but it's a complete tonal mess and has absolutely awful pacing, which makes the stakes in the game really unclear. 
On top of that, none of the characters, and I want to emphasize none of the characters, <laughs> are memorable, likable, or relatable. And finally, the kind of main crux of the game is that the entire game takes place in this dream world of sorts uh, created by the antagonist. And we kind of learn this very early on when a bunch of completely impossible things happen. And that makes the entire world feel hollow, impossible to invest in. And when something surprising happens, we always know it's because, well, of course, this is a dream world, which completely takes the tracks from the feeling of dread. That would be my no. counter argument. Okay. Wow. Um, shots, shots have been fired. Yeah, already, they might have been fired. They didn't <laughs> land, right? <laughs> you suck my battleship. Go on, go on. Okay, give me a response there, Sean. It says, oh, well, it's the first game ever made. Blah, blah, now, blah. shut up. <laughs> 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 Fucking palm over here. <laughs> no, well, just on your last point about, like, I think the whole, the fact that you're inside uh, somebody else's head for the whole game is, like, a brilliant um, setting for the story. Like, you said that, oh, whenever something crazy happens, you know it's because you're in a dream world. Yeah, true, but that means, like, technically anything can happen as well, so you just don't know what the next thing is going to be. And, like... I, I, I know I've mentioned this before, but like parts in the game where you think you're safe and then it throws you throws you like something out of left field and stuff as well. Um the like yeah, anything can happen. You're in this dream world. Like that just for me anyway, that just drives me to find out what the hell is going on. Because you don't find out you're inside I guess we can give spoilers. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, spoilers yeah. for the entire like, day. Yeah, it's an old game. So. You don't you don't find out you're inside Ruvik's mind, basically, until like about halfway through the game. So like at least up until that point, like you know something weird is going on, but you don't know what. And then when you find out that, you're like, okay, this is even weirder than I thought. Like and because up until that point, you kind of think like you're making all this stuff up in your own like Sebastian's head or whatever. But then you find out you're in Ruvik's head, and then it just kind of you're like, how did I get here? How do I get out? Basically, you know. So for me, I thought that was I thought the story was brilliant. To be honest, I loved the story. Mm, and the char- um, and, and the characters like okay I will admit there's like a lot of the I, I think Sebastian's a really good like uh, lead character and I thought <laughs> she, oh oh laugh it up Steve and I thought like no, no, sorry I mean no I genuinely find that funny no but okay go ahead <laughs> explain to me explain to me why Sebastian's a really good character well I, well I would argue like what 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 don't you like about him. Okay, um, I'm just going to ask uh, Michael a question, if that's cool, okay? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> so, Michael, um, if I told you that the main character is a grizzled detective, what would you think of? Um, <laughs> I I wouldn't think it's the most original idea yeah. in the world. It's not. But like, <laughs> but Sean, like, you're, you're, no, I don't care, man. Because, like, yeah, it's, it's, it's not original or anything, but that doesn't mean he's a bad lead character to play as. Yeah, he's, like... It's that stereotypical thing of um, like horror games, like oh, this detective washes into town, he doesn't know what's going on. But like, do you know, like I don't think that's a bad thing. Like it's just a trope can, of the can genre. Can you? Can Can I ask you? Can you just describe Sebastian's character in a word that isn't stoic? Can you give any any description of his character other than stoic? Um, fun. <laughs> he's not fun. I'm sorry. Oh, I, fun. I know I'm meant to be impartial now, but he is not fun. All right, right fuck Sean not... Day, I suppose. Is it? Here, let no, me no, bend no, no. over. Look, and listen, fuck. listen, listen. Just um, for the benefit of the audience, right now, we, we're not doing this in such a way that like we're antagonizing each other. I know, like it might seem that way. Yeah, it seems but that way. this is just a discussion, and like I want to find. Like there are good points in the Evil Within. Like I am not going to deny that. I will say that the. Uh, moment-to-moment gameplay like the gunplay is really good in the evil within i don't mind saying that straight up but we're here to like kind of probe at these points and kind of see like which which parts of the game outweighs the other like does the bad parts outweigh the good or the good parts outweigh the bad i just have to say that (laughs) sebastian like i mean the, the, the general public would be against you on this one sean like there's been a lot of reviews here and Everybody criticizes his character. He's really, really boring. Like, the best you could say about him when you're saying he's fun is that you take it no, very tongue in cheek. That was a joke, me saying fun, but like, <laughs> okay. there's no jokes here, Sean. This is deadly serious. Your life is on the line. I don't think he's like a really funny guy. Like, I'd love to have a beer with him sometime. But uh, mm. no, like, I guess for me, 
like when if I'd have to like compare him to someone, I I I wouldn't say he's like any more different to like Leon in Resident Evil Four. Do you know what I mean? And like I enjoyed playing as Leon. You know, like yeah, he doesn't have his character isn't really strong, but I don't really think in the for the terms of the game world and what you're doing, like I don't think you need to have that much development in his backstory and stuff. And, and there is a bit there. It's not like it's he's totally empty character or anything. Uh, I would, to a certain extent, agree with you that you don't always need like a really strong character to keep a survival horror game moving. Mm. But when you consider the length of this game, you kind of do. Because this is a really long game as well. And, it's, and I know it's a long game because it felt long to me considering how long you go on. Like it goes on for... Would you agree with that? Like it does kind of go on a bit longer than it should, at least. I I think there there's definitely um, chapters in it that are padding. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. But I thought like I think the runtime of it is about fifteen or sixteen hours. Well, depending on you know if you get all the collectibles and stuff like that. Um, I think it. Yeah, it depends. It depends like on you know uh, player to player. I think it took me like closer to twenty. I think I was like eighteen, nineteen hours, maybe even twenty. I don't know, but. I was really sick of it by the end, like, and I think it might have been alleviated a little bit if Sebastian, super fun best friend Sebastian, had cracked a joke every now and then. <laughs> but like, it it drove me mad that like there was no humor in it, and the fact that he um, reacts to everything like he just woke up and he's like, oh, whatever, man, you know, like he was drunk the entire time or hung over the entire time. Just to just to jump in, okay, um, I think. We've seen that there's obviously a divide on Sebastian, okay? <laughs> Whereas Stephen feels he's an unoriginal character and doesn't bring anything new to the table, which I'd agree with. But Sean is maybe making the point that it's not really about Sebastian. Yes, exactly. Um, Fair. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll go with that for now. But now, like, I don't think that Sebastian being a strong character or not... Um, really relates to the game being a good survival horror game or not. Well, this dovetails nicely with the next point I wanted to bring up. What does make a game a good survival horror game? Now, you both mentioned the gameplay and the gunplay, and I think you both think it's good, but maybe for... Sh- now, correct me if I'm wrong, for Sean, this adds to the tension and atmosphere of the game, but for Steve, it turned into more of a somewhat mindless shooter that was more about just making sure you could get the headshots rather than actually feeling tense. I, I will agree that um, there, re- there are a lot of shooting sequences in the game, but I don't think... I wouldn't agree with what you said, Steve, where it's like every level is just like like kill kill all the zombies or whatever to get to the end. Do you know what I mean? Um, I think like there's a lot more to it. There's um, Most levels do have puzzle solving in them, there is the resource management, um, you know, when you do need to, like, it does promote stealth a lot of the time as well when taking out enemies. And, and plus, actually, for a lot of areas, you don't even need to kill or the the haunted, they're called. You can just get, you can get past them if you're, like, good enough. Um, so, and, and to be honest, the shooting, like, I, I did enjoy the shooting mechanics in it, but, like, a lot of people would say it's kind of janky as well. And, like, the the perspective of the camera and stuff doesn't help, which I think the perspective of the camera does help in making it more, um, like, uh, kind of scary in a way, just because it's, like, a claustrophobic camera where you can't really see too far left and right. So And then they did add letterboxing to the whole thing as well, which a lot of people hated, and I kind of would agree with that, even though I didn't mind it too much. But sorry, I'm getting yeah, completely off topic here. <laughs> sorry, yeah. we're talking about shooting mechanics. Right? Let, let Steve respond. Sorry, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> um, just one very quick thing I'm going to say. Uh, I know they're called the haunted, uh, but I deliberately call them zombies very, very <laughs> no, deliberately. That's, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because um, enemy design is another thing that I'm going to get into. But okay. um, so you were saying that, yeah, I, I'm not saying that like every single level is a shooting level. Yeah, there's like a bunch of other stuff going on there. But the main problem that I have with it, like, isn't so much that, like, um, it isn't so much that, like, you know, it uh, dovetails into, like, nonstop shooting. It's that it presents itself as something else. Like, it's 
w- when you looked at the original uh, trailer of this, like it showed lots of like really claustrophobic hallways, really good lighting, and like um, you know lots of sneaking around. And uh, I think it all ends with uh, that spider lady with the long hair, mm-hmm. who amazing, actually amazing enemy design there. I really, she's still one of my favorite enemies. Like enemies who's enemy designs. Sorry, couldn't yeah. quite get those words out. But the problem is like it's presenting that. It's not. It didn't show off the shooting. Like when the game was being marketed, like it didn't show off all the run and gunning that you were doing. It always showed off all these like atmosphere and tonal elements that yeah, weren't enough. really there. Like I mean, there's there's a bunch of little things like uh, that all contribute towards why I didn't get out of this game what I went into it for. If you know what I mean, uh, like. If you look at the box art for it, right, even for example, this is like a really small thing. But like if you look at the box art, depending on your region, you either have like a guy with barbed wire wrapped around his face and screaming mm. or a brain with barbed wire wrapped around his as a, bra- a, bar- a brain with barbed wire <laughs> wrapped, wrapped around it. And like that really suggests a strong psychological thing. But it's not because when you know when you know uh, that the story is basically them being trapped in Ruvik's head, not his head, like it's. I feel like all of that like intrigue is just like sucked right out of it. Um, you know, and like so much work went into like those bits, like the like asylum bits where it's really dark and creepy and the lighting effects. But it's like kind of wasted when you know very you learn very quickly that like all the main action is taking place like in these wide open areas. And like so you might as well just like breeze through the dark hall corridors because you know the main part of it is like all going to take place in those arenas, which I would argue are fun in moment to moment gameplay, but gets really, really old really quickly. I wouldn't say that all like, yeah, there, there's definitely a good few arena parts throughout the game, but there's also there is plenty of parts with um um like uh, claustrophobic combat in like tiny hallways and stuff like that. There's the um, the keeper, which is the enemy with the safe on its head, uh, which shows up a number of times and usually in like very small areas as well where you don't have a lot of room to mm. run around. There's also, um, I forget the name of this enemy, but it's much later in the game. And there's um, actually, before getting on to that, there's also a few uh times you fight Laura the spider lady in pretty like like small areas as well where you you basically just need to run away from her but you need but the way they design the area like it's very disorientating and stuff and how to get away from her you can easily get caught by her um but those two enemies I was talking about I can't remember their names but they have like um they're basically their arms are bound to like a plank of wood kind of going behind their head and um they 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 do a lot of damage they're very hard to kill and basically you face two of these at the same time in a, a really tight room where it's like impossible to hide from them basically so you're just like constantly uh, like some people would argue that yeah it's just like constantly run to the corner shoot them run to the other corner shoot them and it can get a bit repetitive but i think it's just the the fact that they can kill you so easily as well, um, that just for me anyway, that kind of is the thing that I would add fear to add fear to the game for me. If you get me, um, yeah. I don't know was, if I'm did really that take place this very well, but no, I I know what you mean. Did that take place in a barn? I'm trying to remember if it's the one I'm thinking of. The one in the barn was a boss fight, and it was all on fire. Yeah, isn't that right? Yeah, but there was also other times, times you uh, yeah. you interact. I think I. Th- it's it's funny. I think I remember the boss fight itself because I remember those bits. And yeah, that was good. But I don't remember the bosses themselves, weirdly enough, which is quite strange. I'll give you that. They were quite good. But the other bosses you mentioned were huge disappointments, in my opinion. Laura, was it Laura? Is that her yeah, name? Yeah. The spy? yeah. She, when you realize that like her entire boss battle is a puzzle, that all you have to do is like set her on fire to kill her, that fight got so annoying and repetitive like i just found that really irritating and like i i didn't care for and like it was the same with the um the keeper what was it you have to run basically you have to escape from him a couple of times Mm. you fight him a couple of times but the one that i'm thinking of was when you're in the room with all the gas and you had to constantly be turning the gas off and like keep running on that at best was a middling boss fight i think i died a couple of times on it and it just got very old very quickly um 
see a, a big problem that I have here and it's kind of running through all the points I'm making is just that like everything is just so like they do it everything is like elongated for no reason like they always make things longer than they need to be um like I'm trying to think of a good example here um so I, I'm just gonna like take a slightly left turn here right I'd go in a slightly different direction so one issue that I have here that like doesn't like the game doesn't work for me in terms of like uh, building dread. Like it, the ga- the gameplay is where all that is taking place, but not in the story at all, um, in my opinion. But just to get your two cents on it, like the likes of um, when you're exploring hallways and like uh, you're trying to progress, solving puzzles. Did you find them scary at all, or even did they build good atmosphere? Um, I think. Well, in in terms of exploring, I think like like I said before, there are there's there's plenty of times where yeah, because you're you find out you're in Ruvik's head, anything can happen at any time, kind of thing. And I think there was always I I did kind of always feel dread moving through the game, like besides the shooting sections, because in the arena sections, yeah, it was kind of obvious like yeah, you just need to get to the end of this arena by either killing everyone or sneaking past them or something. But um, in the other parts of the game, yeah, I think there was plenty of times where, you know, I was, like, caught off guard by something um, because something, like like you said, something just crazy happened that was, you know, unrealistic. A tripwire? Uh, no, not a tripwire, but, like... Um, or a bomb? No, not a bomb or a bear trap before you say yeah. that. Um, no, just things like, I mean, I know I keep going back to this and maybe it's a bad thing, but like the save rooms, just I that was one of my favourite parts of the game, to be honest, um, just because of how it changed every time you went there, like very subtly. Uh, but then later on in the game, it like kind of really starts like messing with you and stuff and like you kind of start to feel like oh I'm not safe here it's not like a a save room in Resident Evil where the zombies can't follow me in kind of thing Um, Mm. and I think it was once I can't remember when in the game that they start doing it but I think it was once that kind of stuff started happening I was like shit anything can happen now and I I just don't know like am I ever going to get like a a moment to rest where I don't have to worry about something killing me (laughs) kind of you know Um, yeah Okay, um, I'm just going to counteract that point, and I'm going to do it from, like, two separate directions. So, first of all, you're talking about how, um, like, the moment, the gameplay moments that build tension, and that you're walking through, like, har- corridors and that sort of thing, and you felt like a building sense of dread. I'd argue that this game can't really do that, because it throws everything at the player in the first chapter. Like, you literally, the game opens with, like, a lobby full of dead bodies. So seeing a dead body is like nothing at any point in this game. It's absolutely nothing. You see like people being killed like by basically a god. Uh, <laughs> Ruvik like he's basically moving like with like really like lightning fast and killing people straight away. So you know that he has all the power in this game. And like the entire city is like engulfed in a massive earthquake and then like you just wake up somewhere else. So it's just like pfft, okay. Uh, I guess that's our trump card right there. Let's drag this on for another 20 hours. Um, so, like, I'd argue that, like, all sense of dread and tension is just gone after that point. Like, because, you know, they'll never really pick up from there. Like, any other, like, good survival horror game that you might play, it knows to build things really, really slowly. Like, if you look at something like... Uh, God, off the top of my head, um, like the original Dead Space, like you don't see like one of the actual alien or uh, necromorphs until like, God, I'd say it's a good 20, 25 minutes into the game. Like it builds mm-hmm. things really slowly, just having like no enemies whatsoever. It's the same for alien isolation. You don't actually see or hear about the alien for ages. Even Silent Hill, like, you know, you're just wandering the streets and it's completely deserted. It's kind of weird, but you don't actually see any monsters for like good... F- 10, 15 minutes, which for PS1 era is quite a long time. And even then, it goes on even longer after the prologue. So I would, yeah, I'd argue that you can't really build tension to that. I've got another point, but just, is there anything you want to throw out to re- re- uh, respond to that? Um, uh, Just that I don't really think that matters, to be honest, like seeing enemies that early on or anything. Um, And 
I think maybe we have, like, we definitely have a different uh, view when it comes to what, like, what makes us feel dread and stuff, I think, do you mm. know? Um, like, for me, yeah, like, all that stuff happened at the fir- in the first chapter, and I was like, what the fuck is going on? But, you know, after that, you know, like, like I said before, it's just I kind of had that feeling like I have no idea what's going to happen next. Like, what is this game about? Do you know, like I had no idea where I was or where like the character was and like what was going on. And it was the mystery of the story, I think, that really like really immersed me. And I, I really wanted to find out like all I could about the story and what was going on. And that kind of just, yeah, drove me on. But I think... I've just actually kind of made it realize something myself here in my head. So like, um, do you know the way, like when you're progressing, like you can just get like flung to different areas and like, like you said, anything can happen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like personally, I don't feel like that's, I, I'm going to, I don't think that works because like, if we're going back to like classic games, like Silent Hill, the characters never really know if like things are, you know, real or not. Like it's kind of always subtly suggested Like, you know, it's like, wait, did I just see that shadow in the corner? Oh, maybe not. Like, oh, that wasn't there before. Oh, it's always kind of weird, but it's never like, that's clearly impossible, which is what's happening here. Like Mm -hmm. things happen that are just impossible and like it doesn't build to it. It happens immediately. And I realized just now the reason that I think that annoys me is because so like Ruvik is the guy controlling like pretty much all of this, right? Mm. He's like, you know, this antagonist. And I realized Ruvik is just the game designer. He's literally just saying, you know what would be really scary now? <laughs> this. Let's throw this in here because it's scary. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point, I, I guess. think you hit on something very true about it. And I agree with you. I'm not, I'm not saying it doesn't make it a good survival horror game, but there's definitely a sense to the evil within that it's wearing its video gameness on its sleeve. Yeah. Like you go, mm. like uh, the thing that comes to mind is you go into that arena with the spinning blade mm. and you have to crouch down. And I think that's a really cool environment, to be honest. It's a really yeah. novel spin and it makes you think about combat in a different way. Whether that, those sort of, you know, deliberate traps and very gamey aspects make it a good survival horror game or not are debatable, which is why we're here. Mm. Yeah. But like, the thing is, like, in the real world, you'd have to wonder, like, why would you have giant spinning (laughs) blades, like, on a pole (laughs) rotating anywhere? Like, even in an abattoir, like, that's just, like, really impractical. (laughs) Yeah. Wait, John died again in the spinning room, like, (laughs) clean him up, call his wife. Well, I think, I think, like, yeah, the game makes it obvious pretty much from the outset that, um, you know, once you wake up in the uh, the asylum or whatever, Mm. that uh, this isn't real, kind of, you know? Um, and like, I don't think that's a bad thing either. Like, I know what you were saying, Steve, about like, in, like you're comparing this to games where you don't know what's real and what's fake. You know, in this, you kind of mm. know what's real, but then like, or sorry, in this game, you know that it's all, you know, made up. But then I guess there's also this, the question of like, oh, if I die here, do I die in real life kind of thing, you know, for more mm. related to like the side characters and stuff later on in the game. Um, but yeah, it kind of, like, I agree, it does wear that on its sleeve. That's like, none of this is real. Yeah. But, but well, you do, you do know, I think that you can feel pain, like, and stuff like that. Yeah. Like that kind of stuff is all, it feels real to you or to Sebastian anyway. Yeah. I think it's, it's because like, um, like in a game, like for example, in Resident Evil, like you don't really know what's going to come around the corner because like, it's in the set it's kind of like uh, takes place in the video game version of the real world so it kind of has to follow those rules to Mm. a certain extent yeah but this game doesn't so like you're saying like oh that means anything can happen but in my head i'm like saying the exact same thing but rolling my eyes like well that means anything can happen like so it's kind of like well yeah so like it's it's it's, a game not scary like i know but like in like you can't have that in like say resident evil like you can't have like oh well the city just like you know uh inceptioned itself onto each other like for no reason like there has to be like a reasoning behind that if it does happen and then you're like oh but why it's like oh cool well, but like in this game it's like oh something insane happened why because it's a dream okay moving on well yeah okay i guess you're coming at it from an angle of like you need a reason for things to happen and i can see your point but for me like um and i there's probably other games like this i don't know but for me i thought it was kind of like 
So like, you could, some people will call it like a cop out, I guess, and say like, oh, well, this just kind of allowed the designers to do whatever they wanted. Uh, but I think, I think it was just something kind of really interesting and something I hadn't really played in a way before. You know, like uh, I wouldn't say mm. it was totally original because I'm sure other games have done like Dream. You know, it's all a dream or whatever, kind of a similar thing. But um, yeah, I, I thought it was cool. Basically, I I really liked that aspect of it. I, well, that's fair enough. Um, sorry, Michael, you got to say something? No, uh, just uh, this brings up an interesting point, and it's sort of the crux of what we're talking about in a way. So here's a little thought experiment for you, right? If there was a theoretical game that had the combat mechanics of the evil within, as in, you know, very powerful enemies, uh, scarce resources, um, you know, a combat system that doesn't mean you can just do headshots all the time, you know, it takes a bit of... There's a bit of tension there when it comes to whether you live or die. If you had that, but no story whatsoever, no context for where you are, you're just dropped into a level, kill these enemies, and... You're going to have to hide and make sure your bullets count and run from more powerful enemies. Would that be good survival horror? No, I would say. Mm, yeah, probably not. Like, I mean, as even though I have issues with the story, you do. I do think you kind of need the story. It's it's like a porno. You know, you'd miss it if it wasn't there. <laughs> so you do need some context for it to be good survival horror. I think at so. least you need you need something like I mean I think you are right Sean that you don't it doesn't need to like completely rest on that like it, it isn't completely dependent but I do think you need to have something to kind of, something to drive the player forward otherwise like yeah totally yeah because um yeah because it's almost like at the start that you just get dropped into a level and mm. you, you don't know what's going on but it's that that drive to find out is, mm. is what sends you forward mm. you know and like I would say the combat isn't strong enough by itself, um, you know, in this game. Like, it's it's good at times, but, yeah, like, there's those room arena rooms which can just get a bit annoying with, like, enemies spawning and stuff. So those don't add to tension. They just become, okay, I need to kill all these guys. I just need to get past this part of the game rather the only, than... The only tension that gets added with them, I think, is if you die, you're going to go way back or something, mm. you know, with checkpoints and stuff. But, um but that's yeah. a, that's kind of a weird tension in that like yeah. I mean yeah it is tension but like it's annoying as well so like it's, just stress. it's not <laughs> it's like yeah a, I need to it's, it's a tricky one uh, by that, um, can by I that ask notion uh, Dark Souls would be a survival horror game because that's the tension in that as well you're like I don't want to die because I've go fucking ages back and I'll never yeah, fucking no, get I, back here I think well, that's just more actually, like a frustrating thing sorry Steve. <laughs> I feel that's a little different though and this is something that I'm going to just put a pin in. I'm going to mention it now but I'd like to put in a pin in it now because I have a different point I want to make. I think like in this game it's a lot more annoying and unfair than it is in the Dark Soul games. This is largely due to the fucking explosive traps that are everywhere in this <laughs> yeah, game. Yeah. I absolutely hate them in this game but that's just something I'm going to come to later. I want to ask you a question there, Sean. So yeah. this is relates to like the idea of the world being, again, all in Rubik's head, anything can happen, etc, etc. The fact that you get like thrown to different settings again and again, I think really, really hurts the story in this. Like Not necessarily because it's a mess. I, I think it is, but I'll let it slide for now. Like, I don't think that's like the worst thing about it. The fact that you have no idea how, what kind of progress you're making throughout this game, because like, it just like feels like you're going to throw, like you're just going to be thrown somewhere else, somewhere else, somewhere else. If it wasn't for the fact, you know, the game will be over in about 20 hours or so. That's the only indication that you have of how far you're getting. Like, it's nothing to do with the story. So it's like, okay, I've been playing for like 12 hours. I must be over halfway by now. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And on top of that, just before I, uh, just to finish, like, it also means that the ending feels really anticlimactic because it kind of just feels like, oh, well, something else could happen now. And it's only because, like, in the end credit sequence, like, oh, your man pulls the thing out of his head. And even then, that kind of turns into a cliffhanger. So it's like, ah. So the mm. whole thing feels like a massive anticlimax. Thoughts? Um, I'm going to keep this pretty short because I would agree with you for the most part on all that. I think the story, even though I really enjoy the story, I do think it's very um, messy, basically, in how they bring it across. And something we were talking about before the podcast is that, um, like, you only uh, you 
you learn way more about the story actually in the DLC, but we won't get into that. Um, mm. But I think, um, yeah, like I, I, I totally kind of had that same feeling when I was going through that, like I didn't really know how much progress I was making and stuff. Like they kind of drip feed, drip feed you like bits of the story here and there. Um, and it's not really until the last few chapters that stuff really starts to pick up. Um, I didn't like, I didn't hate the ending. Like, um, I thought, um, I, th- I, 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 like, I'm trying to think back to when I played it, to be honest. But I, I, I do kind of remember the the build up to the end, like being good, and I enjoyed that. Um, and then when it was over and it leaves you on that cliffhanger, I was like, oh man, that's class! Like, can't wait to play the second game, which really? I never played. But, <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, but. I'm yeah. not sure the second game even follows the I have no direct storyline, to be I have honest. No spoilers, because I, I, I haven't I, I even Yeah, I, I haven't played it either, yeah. so we're not even going to go into that. This is all about the first <laughs> the game. The main game. Um, but, but yeah, for the most part there, Steve, I would agree with you, to be honest. So Okay. That's well, that point, well, Stone. <laughs> that, no, that's fair. Let's, let's, let's go in the opposite direction now. Here's a point where I'm probably going to agree with you now. Let's talk about the gameplay for a bit, like the moment-to-moment like shooting and stuff. Okay. Um... Just, I'm just going to open with a single sentence. Uh, having a crossbow that shoots explosives is class. Yeah, definitely. The crossbow is... Sorry, guys, the agony bow. Oh, sorry. The agony crossbow? Sorry. Maybe. Yeah. Um, I, th- <laughs> I think the crossbow is the most um, like versatile mm. weapon you have because you can shoot... Um, I know you can shoot freeze bolts, explosive bolts, oh, yeah. regular bolts. Electric. Electric bolts. Is that it? Uh, am I missing a flash reg- one as well? Regular, flash regular. One, yeah. and flash, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and it definitely comes into play in nearly every firefight, I think. Um, mm. Which kind of um, no, I think it's 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 definitely it's it's a good. It, it makes the combat a bit more inventive and in how you can take out enemies and stuff. And um, you can craft bolts, and this adds to like your resource management like I was saying and you kind of need to make sure you have the right ones going into certain fights and stuff like some would be better for some enemies some would be better for others kind of thing um mm. yeah the crossbow's class yeah I kind of thought like when when I was playing it like and uh when I was thinking about this when we were taking notes and research and the like I kind of thought this game would might have benefit just from having the crossbow as the only weapon and different ways of shooting um yeah, it's just an idea now. I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> um, yeah, I think it, you could probably like complete the whole game with just the crossbow. To be honest, mm. um, but well, I think at least having the like a pistol or a revolver um, as your sidearm w- is would definitely help because uh, like the bolts are precious. Even though you can craft them, you got to use resources mm. for that. Um, and you know most <clears throat> most of the haunt, regular haunted can be taken out with one or two headshots. Um, which is probably a bad thing We're talking about like combat but well no it's not really because there's like there's other enemies that there's you have to kill in certain well. ways and stuff yeah mm. Um, mm. and like I would say I enjoyed the shooting in it but it was wasn't the best like it wasn't as refined as like Resident Evil 4 or something um, but maybe there was definitely like more sway to the guns and stuff which I guess was more realistic than Resident Evil 4 um, I yeah. think um what this game did probably better than Resident Evil 4, and this is probably the only real compliment I'm going to give it, but um, it balances like how much ammo you get throughout the game exceptionally well, mm. like really, really well. Like you're never, you never, you're never completely empty going into like a boss fight or an encounter, but like you're almost very close to it, like almost always. Yeah. So that I liked. I'll yeah. give it that. Yeah, totally. And I think uh, because of that, the game really encourages you to like use traps against enemies and um you know like just you yeah use the environment more to take out enemies if you can and use just inventive ways like explosive barrels and the, ma- um, the matches as well the, ma- the matches were a brilliant inclusion like i love that yeah the fact that mm-hmm. once you downed an enemy um they like unless i think i think unless you uh, get out like explode their head basically they would like come back get back up unless you lit them on fire most mm. of them uh, i could be wrong about that but fact check um yeah no, no no that's right that's right yeah but yeah and the matches weren't like infinite either you had to like find matches and stuff so yeah i thought that was really good just to uh a point that i thought of and something that's unique to this game maybe 
Stephen will contradict me here, but I, there's not too many survival horror games with an upgrade tree or up or like those sort of RPG elements. I know Dead Space has some stuff like that where you can mm, upgrade yeah. weapons, but it's not typical of the genre. Do you think no, it helps or hinders this uh, being a scary game? I I don't think it really. Uh, I wouldn't say it has anything to do with it, like if it's scary or not, though. Or as a survival horror experience, I guess. I personally don't think it really has any effect. I mean, the the one thing I could say, and I'm kind of grasping at straws here, like I wouldn't mind if like Sean wanted to argue the opposite, but I'd say it gives a kind of more of an arcadey feel. But like, so that might be a bit to its detriment. But I didn't really get that from this, so I think it's it doesn't really affect it in any way. Like, but having said that, like, it didn't help these. Like, you know the way like uh, upgrades in like your typical action RPG, where like if you have a fully upgraded character versus one who has no upgrades, you can like really see the difference. Mm. In this one, like you barely felt any difference. So like, um... yeah, it's you could kind of say that like. You kind, you're trying to help yourself be better, but the fact that it barely helps you at all is kind of, kind of like you know, like you're trying to grasp at hope, even though hope isn't there. I, I think <laughs> maybe, that, maybe that's bullshit. I don't know. <laughs> I I kind of agree with you, Steve, in the fact. Um, I don't think it really like matters when it comes to is it a good survival horror game. Uh, I did enjoy the the upgrades in it and stuff and like because you had to use that green gel that you found in you which like I can't mm. even remember what the green gel was Slime. about but yeah it was just like oh cool some gel and um yeah I just like I I did like like yes I have enough to get this upgrade now kind of thing. It was just like another progression tree in the game I guess. Um but uh, I, I definitely remember when you upgraded, I think it was like, I don't know if you upgraded the weapons themselves or you upgraded like your ability with the weapons or whatever it was. Yeah, um, it's all in the one, under the one umbrella. Yeah, something like that. But I definitely remember like when I upgraded like that for like my revolver was way better because at the start the revolver is like weak as shit. But once you upgrade that a bit, it's like much more powerful. Um at, at least that, like, I think, I think it's something like more ability to get a critical with a headshot or something like that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I, I, but yeah, to be honest, when it comes down to the game as a whole, I think you could take it or leave it. You know, I think if it wasn't in the game, it wouldn't really uh, detract from it um, much, really. Yeah, mm. I, but but it doesn't really add a lot either. Being there, it's just kind of another progression tree to have. Yeah. Oh no, actually, sorry. Um, Sorry, one. I could be wrong about this, but do you remember in the safe room? Uh, there was a room behind the like clerk's desk with a load of lockers. And yeah. did you use green gel to open them, or did you have to find keys? Keys. You found keys. Yeah. You? Okay, never mind. So, but you could get green gel. You could get them, green yeah. gel in them. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm. But the green gel was only for upgrades. So. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to go on the offensive here, talking about uh, <laughs> gameplay. Things I Didn't Like, oh. <laughs> a memoir by Stephen Hill. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the post office. Uh, no, first, um, <laughs> stealth mechanics in this game, I felt weren't really worth a damn. Um, here's, here, here's my problem with it, right? So in a good survival horror game, utilizing stealth, I think, only really works if the person like you're hiding from can basically kill you in one hit. Like if like you should feel like if you're found, you're fucked. But like in this game, I didn't get that so much. It was just kind of more of a like um mm. you can sneak around and take these guys out if you want to, but like if you just want to shoot them in the head, we're not going to punish you too much for it. So that makes me think, why was it there? Like now I know I already know your answer, Sean, before you say anything. I know it's tried to conserve ammo. Um that's next point that I want to make. Uh Lack of ammo, right, isn't really that scary. It's just frustrating, right? So it's frustrating because, like, once you know you run out, you can't really progress. You compare this to something like Resident Evil, right? If you have no ammo, you can still, like, run around zombies and those, like, awkward tank controls or whatever. Like, you can still get through until you find more ammo. In this game, like, it's all about ammo management. So if you run out of ammo... You're going to have to let them kill you and then try again. And that's just like, you know, 
inarguably an annoying thing to have to do, to have to start again. Yeah, so I, I know what you're coming at this from, like uh, like an Outlast or, um, you know, uh, what was that other one? Um, amnesia? Amnesia, kind of. Like, yeah, you're coming at that from that kind of angle, I think. Um mm. But I would argue that they are very different types of games. And the stealth in this, yeah, okay, one one way is resource management. Um, you know, you can go around, you can take out some enemies that are in your way with a knife kill and get to the end of the room or the area without having to waste a load of ammo. Um, or, you know, take a load of damage and use health kits. Um, but, and, and to be honest... Yeah, to be honest, like I thought it was a valid way to get through a lot of the levels. Like I didn't see, I, I tried to stealth most of the time. I think where when I could, um, um, but I didn't like. I didn't think it was it was bad to be honest. Like um, because the I guess the sense of okay, yeah, I suppose the if you did like mess up and got caught and had all the enemies swarm you, you had to shoot your way out and then you were either going to die if like it was a really difficult part or you were going to shoot your way out, get through it, have less ammo and then you could be fucked for the next area, I guess. Um, mm. So uh, yeah, I don't think like the stealth didn't add like a sense of dread so much as it just being a different way to play the game, I guess. I, I think that would just but be my two cents. Would you not really. say it adds a tension? It Could, add, well, well, a little bit, but yeah, it kind of only, um, only for the reason that you're gonna like lose resources, I guess, or die. <laughs> but, but like, mm -hmm. um, but it, what it w I wouldn't compare it to something like Outlast or Amnesia, where you're like, you're you're literally if you're caught, you're fucked. That's yeah, that's the end true. of the level, basically. Do you know. Um, but they're very different games, so I wouldn't compare them that way. I, I would just compare it more with like generic stealth mechanics, like in Hitman or you know any uh, other kind of third person sort of. game, mm. where yeah, exactly, where you can get through by doing stealth kills. Basically, I think that was the point of it, really. That's fair enough. I guess my main argument to that is just that like it not so much that like it detracts from it, but I just don't feel like it really adds anything considering like the vast majority encounters you have tend to like be ambushes or something like i remember a bit at the very very start when you first arrive at like is it a village the or a village, church yeah. or something mm. yeah and like that was the only time i can really remember using stealth and after that like pretty much every encounter was like go get them fellas <laughs> <laughs> and you just like uh, all right grant <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think there are plenty of other moments to use it, um, you know, outside of the arenas. But yeah. there, there might be. I just don't really remember them. Is all I'm saying. Yeah, fair enough. So just to to go back to talk about this game, but to talk about an older game that has a particular relationship with this. Uh, like we mentioned at the top, uh, Shinji Mikami was the creative director of The Evil Within, and one of his previous games was Resident Evil Four, which set simultaneously set a benchmark for survival horror games but also sort of transform them into survival horror action games in a way and many people feel like the evil within is a spiritual successor to that um how do you think this relationship affects the quality of the evil within um and do you think resident evil 4 is a good survival horror game and how does that relate to the evil within um, lot to dissect there. <laughs> well, let me let me just let me simplify it because I did that was like a word salad. Um, let me throw to Steve. <laughs> Steve, do you think Resident Evil Four is a good survival horror game? Now this this is going to be an interesting uh, response. <laughs> so um, yes and no. Um, Resident Evil Four is like a great game. Uh, survival horror. See, the thing is, horror is such a subjective thing. Mm. No point in Resident Evil 4 scared me, per se. Um, there's frantic moments in it. And that's why I think it's a great action horror game. I don't think it's a great survival horror game. So, like, for action horror, it's really, really good. And I, if it wasn't for the story, I'd probably say the same for The Evil Within. I'd probably say this is a really good action game as well. But survival horror game, no. I don't think Resident Evil 4 is a good survival horror game. Mm. I um, I'm probably gonna like just destroy this whole debate now. But 
I I would say that both games straddle the line between survival horror and action. Mm. I would say um like something like something like Resident Evil 6 is completely just like you know, it's is it even action horror? It's more like, you know, just a Hollywood movie kind of thing. But that's definitely on the extreme spectrum, I think. Don't you, like, like, land a plane or kill oh, the president man, or, just, or something just, in that game? It's crazy. Seconds into it, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, like, that's on, the that's on like, the far right of the scale when it comes to, like, action horror, if that makes any sense. Um, it's at the action side of it. Yeah, it's yeah. on the action side. But I think, mm. I feel like Resident Evil 4 and The Evil Within... Yeah, they kind of straddled the line between the two because um, I would say from like a gameplay perspective, there's a lot of shooting in both of them, which I think um, isn't something that is like... Um, isn't something that Typical. is strange. Well, it's not strange to have in a survival horror, but it is more associated, I guess, with action horror. Um, as far as like big set pieces and stuff go... I would say The Evil Within probably has more than Resident Evil 4. Um, but again, not to the degree of like Uncharted or Resident Evil 6 or you know anything like that. Um, so, yeah, I think... So, sorry, to compare... Um, what, what was the question? To compare it to Resident Evil 4? Or how does it stand against Resident Evil 4? But just in relation, because it's seen as a spiritual successor. So do you yeah. believe... you you? So I think the crux of your argument is they do lean more towards action, but they do still have those horror elements that bring them back and make them survival horror. I think survival horror is definitely the root in both games, mm. but um, but they're leaning a little bit towards action, definitely. Um, when it comes to like those areas where you know you need to, the arenas, you need to kill every uh, haunted or zombie to get past them, um, where, you know, like just sneaking past isn't an option kind of thing. I think that's really more leaning towards the action mm. kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I, w- I would still call both of them survival horror games, but they're straddling a line, basically. And, and just mm. in relation to Resident Evil 4, like personally, um, The Evil Within is like probably like the best game I've played since Resident Evil 4 in that genre like I I actually really liked Resident Evil 5 too but there's no doubt that's more of an action horror game Um, I didn't feel the same like dread or like tense um, Mm. moments or anything with Resident Evil 5 it was pretty much just going your way through Um, but I definitely when playing The Evil Within I felt like just like I was playing Resident Evil 4 again you know, so to me, there's a huge close connection there. And a lot of that's down to Shinji Mikami, I suppose. Mm. Can I actually just quick query? Do you think um, Evil Within or Dead Space, Dead Space 2, for example, is a scarier game? Just out of curiosity. Um, scary. You see, I think when you're talking about like, is the game scary? That's very subjective. And also... Mm. um there can be different ways of it being like I don't think a game needs to be like scary per se to be a horror game you know and maybe I'm wrong there I don't know but the only thing in Dead Space 2 that really scared me was a few jump scares if I'm honest um Mm. the evil within I felt I felt more dread I think and stuff um in the evil within than I did Dead Space because Dead Space, um, I feel it got into a rhythm after a while where, like, you knew, like, like, well, I guess the same can be argued for the evil within in some cases, but you kind of knew when things were going to pop off in Dead Space and, like, you were going to have to kill a load of enemies or something. I guess the same can be said about the arenas and the evil within, but um, I think it was... Um, I felt evil within was more unpredictable when it came to how it was going to how the story was going to progress. Um, mm. So I felt more dread with that, I'd say. But like scary-wise, I wouldn't even... I wouldn't say The Evil Within is very scary, to be honest. Like, I think um, the scariest encounters I had in it were probably with Laura, just because of her, like, shrieking scream her and stuff. Her design is insane. And her design. And, yeah. like, I knew when I heard that scream, I was like, fuck, it's Laura again, you know? <laughs> Here she is. <laughs> and, and, like, um, I'm pretty sure... Maybe I'm wrong, but was she a one-hit kill if she hit you? I think so. Yeah, yeah so there maybe. was it was I think something like that. I know later in the game where um 
Ruvik is chasing you and he can summon yeah. Laura's hands to come out of the ground and they're a one hit kill if they get you. So so it was just like yeah, it was just the the sense of like I'm screwed kind of thing, mm. you know. But mm. um and that was something that I did I didn't ever get with Dead Space. I, it was more about like it just I think Dead Space is definitely more of an action horror game than the Evil Within. But that's another that's fu- story, man. That's another question. That's funny, actually, because like um, I I kind of feel the opposite there because really? like um, yeah, there's probably like more action in Dead Space, but like it's like you were saying that you don't think a horror game doesn't need to be scary, and like I I would actually agree with that. I don't think a horror game does need to be scary, but what it does need to do, I think, is establish a really a really good tone, a, a good horrific tone. And uh, that's why I really yeah. liked um, Dead Space because I thought it did that exceptionally well. Uh, this game, like it's, it it also establishes a tone. Now it's tonally messy as hell, in my opinion, but like it does manage to establish that tone just about. <laughs> but it's the fact that it's always wobbling that threw me off. Like because like you know the arena bits are just like so. It's it's a really bright game as well do you know that's something that actually kind of i noticed as well like there's lots of <laughs> mm. bit in it like where you're just like in arenas and like it's lit normally mm. compared to like something like, like you never have to use oh you do use a torch actually at some points don't you but when you're out in the city yeah. and all uh it yeah. is quite bright hey you, that can be scary sometimes there are bright horror games but they're <laughs> it's definitely not quite as no yeah oppressive. i would agree with you there steve yeah yeah Actually, yeah, that's another thing. When you're in the city, there's a bit like where you're in a gun turret, turret, turret as well. Like, and that's yeah. that's something that immediately like lowers lowers my uh, well, how much I like a game. Wasn't there a gun turret in Silent Hill too? I'm pretty sure every level ended with a gun uh, turret. That famous uh, sim- symbolism uh, gun turret. <laughs> yeah, it's the like... gun turret was his penis all along. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, just to, to kind of just like uh, to emphasize this now, like I do think you are right in a point that you made. It's a really good point that. Uh, a horror game doesn't actually need to be scary and there's a couple of like exceptionally good horror games that i didn't really find scary at all like just off the top of my head like resident evil 4 is obviously a good one but also um silent hill shattered memories and uh eternal darkness sanity's requiem mm. all, all three of those games like i wouldn't really say there's anything in those that really made me scared at all but mm. they're really really good games yeah. and again this is all something that's really subjective everybody's gonna have a different opinion on this how they react to a horror game some people will find like some games absolutely terrifying and other people will say they're like whatever but if you have the tone and like if it feels oppressive like and it kind of gets under your skin even if it doesn't scare you but it kind of gets to you i think that's kind of what establishes a good horror game in my opinion yeah so more psychologically horror like mm. scary or whatever yeah 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 um, just to circle back, uh, Steve, what uh, have you any more thoughts on its relationship with Resident Evil 4? Yeah, so like, I think that it it sort of does hurt this game a little bit. Mm. Like, um, one thing you have to bear in mind, right, this is like around the start of the PS4, like when big changes should have been happening in genre game it it never does like whenever you get the start of a new generation it always kind of carries over some of the previous generation's Mm. tropes Mm. and it kind of wallows a little bit so that's kind of what i feel was happening here um like on the ps3 the only really good survival horror games in my opinion were like the dead space games and maybe the fear games maybe um so like the genre was kind of getting like a little bit stale the Evil Within, uh, like, it's kind of like the last carryover of that before everyone realized, okay, we got to move on. We got to do like different things. Like, mm. cause, and this is something that like, I'd like you to think about. I can't think of any games other than the Evil Within 2 that have kind of gone back to the formula that uh, the Evil Within uh, had, or even like Resident Evil 4 had. They've all kind of gone off in sort of different directions in terms of how it works. You could maybe make an argument for Dying Light, which I haven't actually played, but... Sorry, just one came to mind. What's that new one that's an Xbox exclusive that came out recently? The, not The Observer. Xbox exclusive? Yeah. The Medium? The Medium. Oh, is that Xbox exclusive? Isn't it? I think so. That, yeah. see, see, that one, uh, the reason... That one is an interesting one because that kind of goes like back even further back to like the old fixed camera angles and mm, stuff. Mm. Like you're... You don't have any guns in that game, as far as I know. Yeah, I think and, it's like, not it's all about, Yeah, oh, cool. yeah, it's all about running from enemies. 
But like um, Resident Evil Four, right? That's it's a really great game, but it's re- it's worth noting a big uh, factor in uh, that game's popularity was it was the first of its kind. Yeah, yeah. like it was like it was the st- it was um, coming after a whole bunch of dated games that were still using like PS One fixed camera views and like uh, people wanted a change. So that kind of contributed to how well it's received. And The Evil Within is kind of on the opposite end of the same spectrum. Like, in some ways, it plays it really safe, and it's just kind of like, uh, not a clone of Resident Evil 4, but it does borrow an awful lot from it. And that might be part of why I didn't really like that game as much. Like, because um, if, you, if you switched this spectrum around, right, and The Evil Within came out in 2004, and it was uh, Resident Evil 4 that came out in uh, 2014... But for one thing, that would really mess with the Resident Evil timeline. <laughs> but more than anything, like I'd probably really, really like uh, The Evil Within then. But maybe it's just because I'm just kind of sick of this style, mm. kind of. Mm. Um, maybe, yeah. This is just like conjecture now. I could be completely wrong. It's just a thought of why. But like all, all the really good games and all the really good horror games and action games and all games, they kind of evolve and innovate in some way. Or if they don't do that, they pay homage in really interesting ways. And I don't think this game really does either so well yeah and kind of the opposite could kind of be true for me because i you definitely played more horror games than me steve whereas Mm. me like i've i've played like most of the resident evils dead space the evil within like outlast and stuff like that but i i wouldn't have played um as much variety as you so i guess for me the others is the word that was going to be on your lips i played the other ones <laughs> but, yeah <laughs> but yeah so i guess for me um playing the evil within coming from i, I don't even I, I guess i had played resident evil 6 and dead space and stuff in between mm. um but then playing the evil within i was just like oh class like it's going back to resident evil 4 style and that's what made me really love it you know at the end of mm. the day um, you weren't sick of the genre. No, I want. I wanted just more of like, like good games. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like I didn't like. I obviously I kind of liked Resident Evil Five, but it wasn't the same. Didn't like Resident Evil Six. Loved Dead Space One and Two, um, and then like we didn't really have anything for a while. I like. I think Dead Space Three came out after the Evil Within, but that was maybe like, but so that was so just like, action. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, oh, it was before, was it? Um, well, before, yeah. yeah. Well, I I didn't like that at all, really, either. So then, the Evil Within came out. And I was like, class. But um, yeah. Just can I just say uh, just say one thing to interject? I want to make this very clear. I'm not saying that I was sick of survival horror. Just this particular kind of like yeah, action of survival horror. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah totally. Um, like in my because like I think it's the main thing that I'm going to bring it back to, and I think it's probably where we're going to land on this whole debate thing. Like for me it was all about expectations. And I think actually it's probably the same for you. We just expected different things from this game. Mm. Um, but like for me, like I wanted either a, a game that like showed that like it was full on action and like it wasn't masquerading as horror or like one that just knew it was horror. And it, like, at least we could just settle on that. Like there's two games that I could tell you on the PS3 that basically other end of that spectrum, like uh, one of them, which is actually better than people give it credit for is uh the original Saw game on PS3 hmm. is actually I this I know yeah. that sounds absolutely shocking it sounds mm. like there's no way that's a good game I know you're think both you're thinking that right now yeah. <laughs> but it's actually not bad be- and the reason being that it knows it's a horror game like it's like it's again it's all about traps but like it puts that for, first and foremost at the very beginning so you know that's what you're in for and it's like it's a little predative but it's not bad the other one that I'd also suggest, if you want a really good like horror action game, Shadows of the Damned, very underrated game and just really good game and very tongue in cheek as well. Was that which a, might be why a, I like uh, it? Survive, was that a horror game? I always thought that was just like a straight. Act. That's a Shinji Mikami game as well. Yeah, well, like I mean, it depends. This this is when you you have to get down to like definitions. Like mm. I mean, you have your main character; he's fighting through hell to get his girlfriend back. So like, you know, and you're fighting zombies and stuff. So. That's sort yeah. of like Devil May Cry. Well, here Dante's we're, we're, Inferno. We're, we're splitting. <laughs> we're splitting hairs here as well, I guess. Um, but like, I don't see like how that would be. A, a wouldn't be a horror game, and this and like the Evil Within would be like. Mm. Um. True. Um. I do remember the only thing I remember from Shadow of the Damned is the guy's gun 
gets really long and then he puts it like in front of his crotch and is basically like, this is my dick gun. <laughs> no, no, no. He says, taste my big boner. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's the probably g- a direct quote from the game, is it? <laughs> the, the gun is called the boner because it's made from the skull of like the first demon he killed or something like that. <laughs> I'm sure there's symbolism there, but I'm just not really grasping what the symbolism is. Um, uh, I think it was me. Freud who said, sometimes a boner is just a boner. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Wait, so are you saying that's a good game, Steve? Shadows of the Damned? Yeah. Yeah, it again, it's all down to managing expectations on this because like, that's a very, very short game. And I think a lot of people really hated on it because of that. But right. yeah, I, th- I thought that was really good. Cool. And well, it's also like, it it's, it's, um, it's action horror. It's very, very pure action horror. Like it's not going in like trying to scare you per se. Hmm. You're just going in and you're fighting hordes of enemies. It, it reminded me a lot of um, Resident Evil 4. Okay. So, yeah. Cool. Um, okay, well, we've had quite a heated debate. Um, guys, have you got any closing statements that you'd like to leave us with? Uh, well, I think um, we've both kind of compromised in our arguments. Um, well, in certain certain places in our arguments and stuff. And I kind of think that it's very subjective what each person would, you know, define as a survival horror game, possibly. Um and what is especially what is scary uh, for for horror games, um, but yeah, I think personally, anyway, I've come away kind of agreeing with a lot of what Steve has said. I still love the game; still one of my like favorite survival horror games. But um, I can see his points as well. I hate you so much, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. What, you are being actually nice, right. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's so much easier when we just be dicks to each other. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I think you are right. Uh, a very big part of like uh, this game is just like what managing your expectations and what you actually want from a good survival horror game. And as you said, like sometimes like you can be going into it and you're very dependent on being on the edge of your seat, like, you know, shooting things and just trying to stay alive. And that can be like exceptionally important. And for others, like, you know, the, um, the story and the characters could be like a really big driving force here. And you can't quite forgive the lack of that, uh, when, and like, you can't overlook better features and uh, good features in the game, you know, that don't quite compensate for it in your opinion. So, yeah, I think uh, <laughs> what we really needed to do was have like a 10 second uh, podcast that just said agree to disagree. And that's all we needed to do. <laughs> no, <laughs> we could have just left it at that. <laughs> I think it was good. But no, it to, is. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'm glad that we had that there. And like we can now <laughs> kind of. It's on the table put our, now. Yeah, we can put our finger on the points where like we were like, oh, yeah, well, this was good. This was bad. Do you know what? I never even mentioned the Roombas in that game that have like oh, blades on them. Hell. The dumbest enemies that in the entire so game. That was so annoying, I agree. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, we can, hey, we can agree on that. The Roombas with blades on them were stupid. <laughs> That's, they I think, were I think that so was only dumb. in one chapter or like one area of a chapter as well. That it was really in. close to the end. Yeah, like it was only towards like the very end of the game that they popped up, but they were still the worst <laughs> so thing annoying, in the game. Yeah. I was actually just going to say, earlier agree with one of your points um, about I, I, I think the marketing of the game wasn't done very well because like you said mm. like you mentioned near the beginning that um, they kind of portrayed it as something it wasn't really so yeah mm. I would agree with you there Okay having cool. heard both those passionate compelling and very eloquent arguments um, <laughs> just just to give you my two cents, I haven't played the game. I've watched a complete playthrough of it uh, like a while back, and um, I'm I'm going to be a fence sitter here. Unfortunately, like I don't I, like mainly because I haven't played the game, but also because I I do think there's elements of what just both of what you say is right. Um, like watching playthroughs of like those beginning areas with the barn and like these really like oppressive sort of areas like such tension and atmosphere in them like you do get that sense of dread that you mentioned Sean like always looking over your shoulder and ammo is scarce you have these terrifying enemies like I know Steve wasn't crazy about the design of a lot of them but some of them I thought were genuinely compelling Um, you do have that in abundance but also I feel like uncharted DNA is after getting into this game. It's so weird because 
Shinji Mikami, when he was initially talking about the beginning of the development of this game, he said he felt like horror games had got too action focused and he wanted to bring back <laughs> the horror elements. And you can definitely <laughs> see an attempt at that. Like, it's almost horror that's made so ludicrous and over the top and horror filled that it stops being scary like I'm thinking that bit at the beginning where the guy called the sadist is chasing you then he locks you in a room and a million blades come out of either side of the room (laughs) then you barely escape them and you go down like uh, a slope filled with blood and viscera and land in a pool of like blood and excrement and all this horrible stuff and I was like you have to laugh at it almost. It's so over the top <laughs> yeah. and intense. But like, that's its own thing. Like you, you both mentioned, horror games don't necessarily have to be scary. There's a sort of twisted um, grossness to lots of parts of the game that I think is a bit underrated. Um, mm. But some of those set pieces are really over the top and way too... Like the third section we are talking about and a lot of that stuff does deflate those stakes to a certain degree so um i have to i have to fall in the middle unfortunately it's funny what you say about like how you have to laugh at some of it like i honestly feel if the game was a little bit tongue-in-cheek i would be i'd be a lot kinder to it Mm. like it would just be like if if you've been going around if sebastian super fun sebastian (laughs) had been walking around and going like Oh, like a Frankenstein's monster, how original, but obviously better writing. You know, I thought that would have been really good. <laughs> how can but, you write um, a better line than that? It's so <laughs> um, Cool. Well, that's our debate. Our motion has been passed. I don't know how debate ends. Um, but yeah, <laughs> agree to disagree. We all agree to agree disagree. Agree to disagree. But I guess if anyone listening, I guess it would be nice to hear anyone who agrees with me mm. anyone who agrees with Sean just don't even bother <laughs> that'd be great I, re- I really want to play it again now actually if anyone agrees with Sean can you roll your opinion up in a little ball and just shovel up your arse um, <laughs> so Sounds, yeah no, <laughs> I have no comeback for that <laughs> do no do let us know guys um, in, we'll be putting this on YouTube let us know in the comments where you fall on this debate uh, what you think of it and the survival horror genre in general can we do uh, a poll on no okay cool we can't we do a poll I tried guys. to do one sorry but they removed no the poll. poll function on YouTube oh, sake, really? okay. um, fun fact for you um, so if if we're done talking about this bloody evil within let's talk about what we're playing at the moment Sean what are you playing well I am playing a game that I've wanted to say for a long time the evil no <laughs> 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 uh, Red Dead Redemption 2 a game that Ooh. like um, I've wanted to play since it came out, but didn't have the means. So I start. I finally started to play it. Mm. And um, how long? When did it come out? Two years ago. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 2018. 2018. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Um, but yeah, and I am loving it. It's like one of the best looking games I've ever played. Um, You're playing it on Stadia, right? I'm playing it on Stadia. Yeah. yeah. Um, looks amazing. Um, it's very. I would say. Like we were talking about before, Michael, and um, it's like kind of uh, slow, like your movement is kind of slow mm. and like like the way you need to pick up everything individually and like there's an animation for everything. Yeah. But I really like that as well because it definitely immerses you more in the world. It's not just like you just grab something and it's instantly in his infantry kind of, mm. you know, but um, like, yeah, I, it, it's just... What what can I say about that game really that like hasn't been said before? Do you know it's it's just a beautiful game. I think I'm still pretty early in it. Like I've been playing for I don't know how many hours I've got into it, maybe ten. But I'm still I don't know anything about like the game now. So please it's don't spoil it. Ch- it's a chonker of a game. There's a lot to it. Yeah, <laughs> well, I'm at the point. Uh, my camp is still at um, Valentine. Uh, Valentine. My yeah. camp is still there, so I know. Like, I have mm. been told the camp moves a few times, so I I don't know how far I am, but loving it at the moment. It's just so hard to put the time in for it because, like, one mission in the game might take you an hour because, like, you need like there's you need to, like, go to a place and, like, do a, th- a thing before you get to the main mission, all this kind of stuff. And then there's loads of distractions from side missions and everything and Hunting. collectibles. And, yeah, but it's great. I'm lo- and it's, it's really just after taking me back to the first game, and I loved the first game so much, so, yeah. The real question is, is Red Dead 2 a good survival horror game? (laughs) I would argue yes. (laughs) 
Do you know what's so frustrating about just while you're talking? I remember one really good point I was planning to bring up in, re- in the Devo Within debate, and I what? completely forgot about <laughs> Too it. Too late, I guess. <laughs> Sorry. No, go uh, ahead, Steve. Why is it? Say it, say it. Off the record. Uh, I, I was going to talk about like the whole stamina meter in the Evil Within is a big pile of shite. Um, just b- because like uh, you get other like survival horror games that like yeah you, you sort of have a stamina meter in that you can run at a normal speed for a while but then you run out of stamina and you slow down and that's fine but in the Evil Within you do this stupid thing where once you run out of stamina you like stop and do a bit of a <sighs> <sighs> yeah. and then just kind of straighten up again and like that's so dumb because if you're being chased by like a giant mannequin spider lady who's right behind you, it doesn't matter how out of breath you're going to go, you're going to keep running or moving, even if it's at no speed whatsoever. I that got, was a real dumb, dumb move. <laughs> yeah, I got to be honest, I don't remember the stamina meter actually. Maybe Plus, you're just really good at managing your stamina. Maybe. Wink, wink. Um, but, <laughs> maybe. But would that not add to the tension, Steve, that you're like, oh my God, I, I can't move, I'm frozen? No. See, this is the thing. It's another one of those, like, you know, it's it's annoying more than, like, scary mm. because, like, you know, it's the game kind of arbitrarily telling you, it's like, you can't run anymore. Like, it's fine that, like, yeah, if you can't, if you're run out of stamina, you slow down because then it's like, oh, God, he's going to get me. He's going to get me. But instead, it's like, you know, because, like, in other games, like, the monsters generally be faster than you when you're out of stamina. But in this game, it's like, okay, you're out of stamina. Stop for a second. Regain your stamina. Oh, no, too late. You're dead. Yeah. It's just, it's a very small thing, but that change I think was re- a really bad decision in this game. Jeez, you can't stop this guy talking about Steve Within. <laughs> Every day it is. I you. love it so much. Um, <laughs> I wanted to be my girlfriend, Steve. Uh, Steve, what game are you playing at the moment? Ah, uh, so I realize a little flaw in this thing that we've been doing. That like, if you ask us like what we're playing, we're always going to say the really long games. Because, like, you'll finish, like, a short game in, like, a day, and then you'll move on to a long one. So, with that in mind, I deliberately saved two short games, like, for last night so that I could say I talked about it, if that's cool. So um, um, You cheated at our question, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, there's research, and then there's research. <laughs> there's, I researched that research. Um, so, one of the games I'm playing is by our good friend Terry Kavanagh. Mm, it's uh, VVV, VVV. Five Vs, isn't it? Six Vs. Six, six Vs. VVV, VVV. Yeah. yeah, cool. Yeah, I know it's six Vs because well, I didn't know this before going in. That title is actually really clever for a couple of reasons. So, like, the whole thing of the game is you're, like, an astronaut and you're trying to save your five crew man- members. And every crew member's name begins with V. Mm. So it's, like, VVV, VVV. Uh, really good game actually like uh, do you guys have you heard of it or anything yeah. like you fl- you flip to opposite walls and there's I guess the other thing you were going to say is that like the V's represent the spikes that are on the walls that's yeah so that's the thing like there's spikes like all over the place so they yeah they do represent that but also not only that the fact that like you flip from like bottom to top so like even like if you look at V V V V V mm. it's literally like down up down up down oh, up cool, down yeah. up it's like lots of little things about that are really, really clever. It's a great game I'd recommend to anyone. It's only like about two hours tops, I'd say, to complete. So highly recommend. That Terry the Cavill other is a game. smart man, I think. Yeah. What's he at he is, now? he's good. He's yeah. um Evil Within Three. Evil Within Three. Yeah, he's developing <laughs> that, yeah. <laughs> is he is he actually Irish or is it just his name? I think so. Yeah, I think he is. I, maybe I'm making a massive assumption here, but I, if he isn't, I don't want to know. To be honest, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he is in our. With a name like Terry Cavanagh, like surely, like, uh, yeah, he is. I'm just looking at him now. Oh, he lives in London. He's near you guys. Sure, oh, really? Get, get him on the podcast. Get, get him on the bell there, <laughs> Terry Cavanagh. Tea time with Terry. Definitely look him up. I'm emailing him right now. <laughs> um, what's the other game you're he- playing, Steve? So the other game, by night, I'm playing uh, Five Nights at Freddy's. Oh, wow. Which okay. Yeah. I've never played. Have you guys played that before? I'm no. sure you've seen YouTube videos, yeah. but uh, like everybody. Um, actually, better game than I was expecting, I have to say. Hmm. I was really expecting just gimmicks, um, but it's kind of, it's, it's, it's good. Like, it's, um, like it's, it's sort of not really a game in the same way walking simulators aren't quite a game, if you know what I mean. Mm. Like it does have like a lose state, but like if you kind of know a level well enough, you can be like, okay, I've got about a minute and a half where nothing happens here so I can check my phone. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it is like tense the whole way through. So uh, 
Yeah, it's pretty good. I don't know why there's like five sequels though. I feel like they couldn't really change much without changing the entire game. Um, so I'd say money was the main uh, <laughs> motivator yeah. for all those sequels. <laughs> They, they did they seem do to have, be reskins, basically, yeah. They do have a, a VR version, which I got as well, because I'd be interested to see what that's like. And I think I saw a recent video where they've kind of changed it um, to like a third-person shooter or something. Kind of like a, a new PS5 game, actually, yeah. Yeah, it's it's kind of like they did the um, the whole Plants vs. Zombies thing where, you know, you have a fairly simple addictive concept and then they made it popular by turning it into a shooter. So I feel like it was a dumb move. But mm. anyway... That's what I've been playing. So the big question, the one we've all been wondering. Yes, here we go. Michael, how are you getting on? <laughs> Thank you. Finally, <laughs> someone asked. I'm I'm about uh, at a at a yellow on the scale right now. <laughs> Read into that what you will. Um, so what I'm playing at the moment, which I think uh, you know, the subtext of what you're saying was there. Um, mm. Actually, like you, I'm playing two shorter games. Um, oh. I. I start. I got a load of indie because there was an indie sale on PSN during the week, so I got a load of indie games for dirt cheap. And one of them I got was a game called Downwell, um, which is Ooh. really cool. It's like a. I wouldn't describe it as a side-scrolling shooter. It's a down-scrolling shooter. So you're constantly <laughs> going falling down this pit, but you can shoot uh, vertically. So shooting down bit words basically and. Uh, very simple uh, art design, which is really cool. What one thing I love about it is, um, it's a roguelike, and uh, when you die, you have to restart the entire game. Um, but like, as you for every run through you do, you get some points, and you can use those points to unlock different palettes. So it reminds me of a game that came out a while ago called uh, Luftwas- Luftwaffers. Luft Ross. Luft- Luft- oh Luft- yeah, I remember that one. Yeah. Luft. Uh, We'll figure out how to love bosses, yeah, something like that, and that had something similar where you could uh, you could use different palette styles on the game, and like I know that sounds stupid, but it's genuinely fun to do that. Um, like there's one that like emulates a Game Boy style um, look. Oh, that's cool. And one that emulates like a Virtual Boy uh, look <laughs> as well, which is like you can only play it for a few minutes before your eyes start to bleed. Um, <laughs> really fun game that sort of addictive gameplay loop that you find in stuff like Hotline Miami where you, like, you just want to re- instantly restart and get back in and very simple mm-hmm. controls a lot of fun I have to say yeah I played a bit of it last night so it was really good um, the other game I'm playing and I just started it is um, an Irish game called The Little Acre um, oh, so, I know friends who worked on that yeah I remember we uh, talked about that before Steve and I think Maybe I'm wrong, but did we see like a prototype version of that at a yeah. game con- convention we went to? I think it might have been Arcade Con or something like that. Mm. Uh, back in the day when, you know, conventions could happen. Um, yeah. yeah, and before that disastrous one we went to. Uh, <laughs> we, don't that. That we don't speak of that. We don't speak of that one. But yeah, fire. no, we... we <laughs> yeah, we saw that like um, when it was it was near completion. I remember, and they kind of demoed off an area in that game. And I remember at the time thinking like, just had a, I just had a glance at the screen, and I remember it was like a, it's a point and click kind of game, isn't it? Mm, More yeah. or less. Yeah. And I remember there's a bit like where you're outside your house, and there's like an old rundown tractor mm-hmm. like in the corner, and I'm like, this person gets Irish <laughs> Irish yeah. lifestyles, yeah, because yeah. even the doll has one of those right outside. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Any Irish street, any directions you give in Ireland, you say go left at the broken down tractor. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, Turn right at Starbucks. I've only played it for a minute, and I do like it. I have to say, I was I was I was I was actually going in with low expectations, saying thinking I would hate it, thinking it would be like all fiddle dee dee paddy wackery sort of stuff and like there is an element to that like mm. there I, I'm not sure where it's based but it looks like the west and like it's a farmhouse with like a broken stone wall and a tractor and all like that and your man looks like you know Jamie Dornan out of Wild Mountain Time and <laughs> the clothes he's wearing and stuff but you know there's certain little elements that are you can tell it was made by an Irish studio which I like um, mm. like the setting time setting I think must be like the 80s because you get a newspaper at one point and there's something on the newspaper like a headline that 
is to do with the plot of the game. But then there's like a little side article about like a fuel strike, which is something that happened in Ireland mm. in the, what? the late That's 80s. Unreal. So like those little details That's pretty cool. are things that make it f- like feel more real for me. And like the uh, the main voice actor isn't amazing, but he is Irish, you can tell. And that's a mm. particular bugbear of mine is non-Irish actors trying to do Irish accents in games. Um, also, like, the, I, I like the control scheme. Like, doing a point-and-click adventure on a console is always a recipe for disaster. And I think they mm. do a pretty good job. Um, some of the screens have very weird walking paths, so you can... You're not sure where you can walk in the screen, and it can take like there's mm. no walk fast button, I think, either, and that's very annoying. Um, ah, yeah. But the some of the background art is amazing. It looks really, really beautiful. It almost reminds me of like um, what were those Irish animated films, like The Legend of Kells and stuff like that. Oh yeah, Song of the Sea, Song of Wolf the Sea, Walkers. Yeah, it it sort of reminds me of that art style. It's um. I'm I'm actually quite liking it, and it's been a long time since I played an adventure game, a point and click game. So I'm sort of getting into that mode of okay, try every item on this thing and see what happens. <laughs> um, mm. So yeah, I'm, I have to say I'm really enjoying it. Sick. All right. Cool. Well, guys, thank you so much for battling it out and coming to no conclusion but you know that's what, <laughs> that's what good debates are about um, let us know what you think guys let us know what you're playing and um, we'll be back with the next one mm. yeah uh, cheers Steve um, it was very um, productive and informational for me so <laughs> yeah. yeah well and uh, listen you made some good points man so I, I definitely there's a little bit of me that kind of wants to go back now not really but kind of and play so, it again like. <laughs> A little bit, yeah, yeah. So, like, there were some good bits there that you reminded me of. I was like, oh, yeah, actually, that was pretty good. So, yeah, I think we came out of it quite well. Yeah, uh, like, yeah, we reached a a mutual um, understanding understanding on it, yeah. Yeah, the peace we're still going to rip each, the shit each other out or anytime it comes up in conversation later we'll be like oh that shit game that you like oh. yeah I can't wait to, I can't wait to find the next evil within that we're going to debate as well. there's going to be a game there's going to be something uh, join us Surely. join us next month for Pong is it a good survival <laughs> horror game to debate <laughs> right. good luck everyone see you boys right. cheers cheers